Now let's consider an application of this triangle removal lemma. So let's consider this statement, which is called Ross's theorem. This is a statement in number theory. So for every epsilon, it says that there it is n0 such that the following holds. For all n less n0. So if we have a set A, which is a subset between 1 and n, if it has a list epsilon n numbers, then A contains a three term arithmetic progression. So arithmetic progression is something like, I mean, 3, 7, 11. So this difference is same. Three numbers which with a common, common difference say. <coughs> and what it essentially says is that uh, if you consider a subset of the all natural numbers, and we can consider the density of this. For example, I mean, you can consider intersection with this and the number between 1 and n, and you divide by n, and then you can consider the rim soup when n goes to infinity, then this is uh, upper density. So this measures uh, how many, I mean, how dense this set A is in this natural number set. Whether if this is positive, then this has a, you can say this has a positive density in the, or the integer, I mean the natural number. For example, if you take all the even numbers, then this is actually half because roughly, I mean, half of the numbers are here. If you take all the multiple of three, this has a density one, one three. <coughs> anyway, this essentially says is that if you have a positive density set inside of this natural number, that it must contain the, I mean, arithmetic progression of length three. So Ross proved this for three-term arithmetic progression, and then Samoredi later generalized to whether any length, I mean, term arithmetic progression. And for example, I mean, and if A is a set of all prime numbers. Then this is actually zero. Its density goes to zero. So Ross's theorem or the Samoredi theorem does not apply to set of all prime numbers. But the uh, last decade in 2000, I don't remember exactly exactly when, but the Greenhow theorem. I mean, what I mean, Greenhow theorem essentially proved is that uh, for the prime numbers, you can find the uh, arithmetic progression of arbitrary length inside of the prime numbers. So which is a uh, strengthening of, somehow I mean strengthening of this Ross theorem or Samoredi theorem. <coughs> anyway, this Ross theorem, we can prove it using the triangle removal lemma. So for this given epsilon, we find delta as in the triangle removal lemma. So that any n vertex graph with at least delta times n cube triangles can be made triangle free after deleting say epsilon over 100 times n square edges. So our epsilon is our choice. So instead of epsilon, we take epsilon over 100 as uh, our epsilon inside of this lemma, this triangle removal lemma. 
So this is true for I mean we can set up the epsilon. So we can set epsilon 100 times so that uh, this works with uh, epsilon over 100. <coughs> and we read m0 be the 100 times delta 2d negative 1. And assume a is a set between 1 and n. And it does not contain three term arithmetic progression. And we consider a tripartite graph G. So what we are going to do is we consider a graph based on this set A. So that the triangle there corresponds to a three term arithmetic progression inside of A. So how do we do it? We consider this tripartite graph G with parts X, Y, C, where each of X, Y, C are identical to the number between 3 and n, I mean 1 and 3 n. So X, Y, C, here 1, 2, 3 n, here 1, 2, 3 n, 1, 2, 3 n. Note that this one and this one and this one, we consider it as a different vertices. And for X in X and Y in capital Y and G in capital G, we add an edge at edges by the following rule. If y minus x is inside of a, we add an edge. And if g minus y is in a, we add an edge. If g minus x over 2 is in edge, we add an edge. So if a, con a has, a, say, 2, 6, 10, for example, then you have x and y, then you have this 1, 2, 3, that's a uh, difference 2. And 3, 2, 13 is difference 10, so we add. And 1, 2, 13, difference is 12, and divided by 2 is 6, so you have. So in this way, so let's say 2, then again you add uh, H2, 4. And also 1 to 7, because 6 is there, and 1 to say 11. So in this way, we can consider the graph. And one thing we know is that uh, if x, y, g is triangle, in G, then we have y minus x and g minus x over 2, g minus y. These three numbers. In these three numbers, you take the, these two numbers, you add them. No, okay. You take the average of these two numbers, then it's the middle number. So, it means that the, the distance here, if you take the average, you get the, this number, meaning that the, these two distances are same. So this is a triangle, I mean, arithmetic progression. So it's either a three-term arithmetic progression, or there is another case, degenerate case, that they are all same. But uh, what have we assumed? We said that A does not contain any 3AP, any 3 term arithmetic progression. So all such triangles 
must be on the latter case. And such degenerate triangles, such the lateral triangles, can be all counted by choosing x inside of x first and a inside of a. If you have no x, then you have x plus a here x plus 2a here. So this determines the triangle so that the difference between these two is a, this two is a, this two is 2a. Hence, there are at most, so x contains 3n vertices and a contains the size of a vertices, which is a also has size at most n. So which is and most 3n square vertices, which is smaller than delta times 9n cube. <coughs> mm, let's see, give me a moment. I think for the computation, we might have to take the 1000 delta to the negative one here. Then, I mean, this holds. Note that uh, you have a quadratic term here and, I mean, and cube term here. Right, and n is bigger than n0. So, you have this inequality. So, it has less than Delta times the, so G has this many vertices. So, I mean, number of vertices to the cube times delta triangle. <coughs> so, you can apply triangle removal lemma to this graph G. But, it has more structure. For each X inside of this capital X, and a inside of this capital A, which say x is at most n, we consider a triangle x, x plus a, x plus 2a. So note that uh, every element in here is at most n. A is at most n, x is also at most n. So x plus a and x plus 2a are all at most 3n. So it's in y and g. This triangle, there are n times a many triangles. So you choose this, you choose this, then you get this. And all those triangles are actually disjoint. Because once you choose one pair, then you automatically know the third pair, and then it uniquely determines the triangles in here, among these n times a many triangles. All edge this right. Hence, if we want to make the graph triangle free, then we need to delete at least one edge from each of these edge disjoint triangles. However, by the triangle removal lemma, we can delete all edges, I mean all triangles. We can remove all triangles.
by deleting and most epsilon times 9 and square over 100. So that was our choice. Our choice is that uh, whenever it has less than delta times n cube triangle, you have to delete just at most epsilon over 100 times n square edge. So you have to delete at least a, n times size of a many, but it's at most epsilon times 9n square over 100. So this implies that size of a is big, smaller than epsilon n. So this proves what we want. So if we have a set with no arithmetic progression of length 3, then it must have a size at most epsilon n for arbitrarily small epsilon. <coughs> so this shows that the maximum such set, I mean 3AP free set A inside of, I mean, numbers between 1 and n has, say, maximum such set has size 0 of n. And this is known to be, this maximum of size of A is known to be, I mean, lie between these two. n times e to the negative some constant times root log n and n over some log n to the 1 minus 3 log 1. Note that this number is smaller than n to the epsilon for any epsilon. So roughly, if you rewrite this, this is similar as n times uh, e to the like negative log 1 minus 3 log 1 log log n <coughs> and this is e to the some constant times square root of log n so you see the I mean difference so so here I mean we use this counting lemma in the case where we have VA, VI, VJ, and VK, and this is epsilon regular, this is epsilon regular, this is epsilon regular, then we count the number of vertices, I mean, number of triangles. But in general, I mean, if you have a G and you apply the regularity lemma, you have a much more complicated structure. Some of them here might be no edges between or not epsilon regular, so we can have a more complicated setup. But if you want to count the number of triangles in G, what you have to do is you just take a triple where all the pairs are epsilon regular and then you count the triangles there and triangles there and triangles there. And for the triple which that the one of them might not be epsilon regular, that only contributes the error term because we know that this only happens with epsilon times R square, I mean, parts. And then maximum number of triangles in here is at most I mean, n over r cube. So those are, I mean, if you, and you have to choose r more because this is not epsilon regular. And then you have to choose, I mean, one part outside. So in total, it is only contributes some epsilon times m cube, which is, which can be considered as a t error term. So essentially what you have to do is you just take the, all the triples so that the, the, I mean between them are epsilon regular and then you estimate them. You apply the tri I mean, triangle removal lemma to each triple. Then you can estimate the number of triples in G. This can be actually made a bit more rigorous. <coughs> I mean, we briefly just introduce the more general version of counting lemma and removal lemma. Let's say a uh, map phi from a uh, graph F to graph R is a uh, homomorphism. 
if it maps edges to edges. So if you have some UVW, then if you map U to here, that is an edge, and both of the vertices to here, then this is a homomorphism. Before, in, before the, uh, we consider the embedding, in embedding, we have to make sure that uh, this map is injective, but here we don't have to have an injective map. This maps here, and then this edge maps to here, and this edge maps to here. So as long as edges maps to edges, I mean, this is uh, okay. Then we say that this is a homomorphism. Sometimes we allow the graph here to have a loop. For example, if you have this, then U, V, W, you can map both U, V to this X. It's okay because, I mean, X, X is a loop in here. So we consider it this way. And yeah, this could be go here. Then this is also a homomorphism. <coughs> Note that, I mean, this has a uh, usage in many other contexts in the graph theory. For example, we know that the graph F is k-partite if and only if there exists a homomorphism from F to kk. I mean, if this is k-partite, then you consider the this kk and then embed, I mean, put all the vertices here and all the vertices here then all the edges map to edges because this is independent set. There is no two vertices with uh, edges, so I mean it embed it maps to one vertex. And we can define I mean we can define a parameter which counts the number of homomorphism from a graph F to R. And then we can even I mean, generalize this to weighted graph. So we can write that for f to r, we can define, say, homomorphism number from f to r with the number of homomorphism from f to r, if f and r are just simple graphs. But we can even, I mean, generalize this to weighted graph. So we have edge weights for each edge E. That weight is between 0 and 1. Or sometimes we further condition, we we'll consider this R as a complete graph by giving weight 0 to all non-edges uv. And for a given graph f and the map phi from the vertices of f to vertices of r, we let the I mean, homomorphism number of this specific map is the this number v multiply the weights. So, for example, if you have uh, this f and you have uh, r. And this is one half and one third. If you consider this map, this phi has homomorphism number one over two times
times 1 over 3 1 over 6 and if you consider the this map both of the these vertices go to here then homomorphism of this map is 1 over 2 times 1 over 2 1 over 4 and here there is no edge then we just consider this as 0 then what you do is if you have map this to here and this to here and this to here then you have the homomorphism number of this is 0 times half which is 0 so remember I mean recall that the, in the triangle counting lemma here what's this this is that we have this triangle and then you consider the reduced graph 1 2 3 with the density 1 2 1 3 2 3 so consider this as edge weight and you consider this i mean p1 p2 p3 you consider this you fix this homomorphism which is encoded in here we want to embed vi to this large vi so this homomorphism embeds vi into i say in this reduced graph and this is exactly the homomorphism of phi of this triangle in, into this reduced graph r and then with uh, some error term so you see the analogy between this and this <coughs> and we define homomorphism number from f to r we, we consider all the map from f to r of course i mean if, if this is not homomorphism then they all become zero i mean some of them some of the phi is not homomorphism then this term becomes zero and you consider the above homomorphism and we add then this is the homomorphism number so note that the, if the all edge weights are either 0 or 1 then this R can be identified with a simple graph. All the pairs with the uh, edge weight 1, we add an edge. If it's 0, we don't add an edge. Then we recover this definition of counting the homomorphism. And let's write the uh, automorphism of F with the uh, number of automorphism. So this is automorphism number. So here automorphism is uh, isomorphism from F to itself. So for example, if you have a triangle, then the, there are three factorial ways to map the vertices to other vertices. All of them are isomorphism. So automorphism number of K3 is three factorial. Then using this concept, we can write the counting lemma. In this form. <coughs> so, before the here, what do we have? We have this error term. For a given epsilon, we can get this error term. That depends on this triangle. If we want to find the bigger term, then this dependency here, the ten is some not optimal number so which is just some number which so k3 has three edges and then this is some number a bit bigger than three so it works so if you want to do k5 then it has 10 edges then this could be 
a bit bigger, say 20 would work. And if you say K100, then this has 5,000, roughly 5,000 edges. Then you just put like, I don't know, 1 million, then it would work. 1 million is a bit overkill, say, probably 2, I mean, 10,000 would work. So this is some error term which depends on epsilon. But if you, sh I mean, so in this case, this is one, I mean, you see epsilon first and then you see this error term. But the, what we actually are doing is, in the situation is that we have specific target of how many, how much error term we can, I mean, endure. And for given this error term, you compute the epsilon and then you apply the regular lemma with that part, that I mean, that number, so that the, you get certain partition. So the, I mean, correct order is that we decide uh, this error term first, and then epsilon comes. Epsilon is small enough so that uh, we get, uh, I mean, error term smaller than what we wanted. So, for given gamma, which is the error term we are willing to endure, and the graph f, so number of edges in this f also matters. Then we can find <coughs> um, okay, let's just write it this way. Epsilon zero and n zero r zero satisfying the following. for all epsilon smaller than epsilon zero and r bigger than r zero and bigger than n zero and let g be a graph with an um, say equitable epsilon regular partition so again I mean, this equitable is not really necessary, as we discussed before. If we have an epsilon regular partition, then we can replace it with an equitable epsilon regular partition by sacrificing this epsilon a lot, I mean, a bit. So we can increase this a bit, and then you can make it equitable. So this is not really essential. So V1 to Vr, and let R be on say epsilon zero reduced graph. With edge weights P I mean weights between I and J as the density between V I and V J. So this is the edge weighted graph. Then the number of copies of F inside G is, we can actually compute it in the other way, in this way. With uh, some error term comma. So this is the error term we can, I mean, endure, we are willing to take. And then this part, so you consider each homomorphism, so this part can be rewritten as a, this. So for each, I mean, we, deep, so this is actually 1 to R, where each of them 1 to R corresponds to actually V1 to Vr. So you decide we have a copy of f here. You decide which vertex should go to which, I mean, cluster of this reduced graph, I mean, regular, epsilon regular partition. And then for those choices, you compute this, which is essentially the, I mean, multiplication of the densities there. So if you have a f here, and then you have v1, v2, v3, and you want to embed that here, then you compute D1, 2, and D2, 3, and you multiply them. That's the roughly the number of, I mean, number of these copies of F, which 
that the, each vertex maps to the corresponding cluster. That's uh, as we have shown, shown in the triangle, triangle counting lemma. So you do that for all this phi, then that counts the, all the triangles in this G, where the each, I mean, each vertex is mapped to different cluster. But you have to divide by this automorphism of F because you have a triangle which maps to say B1, B2, B3, or B1, B3, B2. Those two are actually same triangle. But they are counted multiple times here. And then the number of times they are counted is encoded in this number of automorphism between triangles. Uh, give me a moment, let me answer the phone and start the video again.